I'd like to ask you all to close your eyes for a few moments, if you will. Try to imagine that it's night time. You're lying in your bed, comfortable and warm. Perhaps you're thinking about the day that just passed. You're listening to the gentle rhythmic breathing of the person near you. Your thoughts are swooping and gliding, moving through the liminal space between consciousness and unconsciousness. Sleep slowly blankets you. And then a woman's scream jolts you awake. It was in the alley outside. You hear another, closer, then other voices full of fear. You sit up and try to look around, but something is stinging your eyes. It's as though someone were burning chilies. You try to speak, but an invisible fire scorches your throat and tears at your lungs. Coughing, gasping for breath, you reach for your lover's hand. They are wheezing, groaning. You stagger to your feet and pull them towards the doorway. Pushing open the door, you stumble into a surge of panicking people. They are running, yelling, shoving to get away. Street lamps are dim brown pinpricks of light. Through the haze, you see a neighbor slumped to the ground, racked by seizures. An old man is knocked over. Unable to rise, he falls under trampling feet. Right by your house, a small child froth oozing from her mouth, is choking to death. You begin to run. Each breath is agony like dagger thrust to your chest. You're taken by the human flood, but the force of it wrenches your lover's hand from yours. You will never see them again. Close to collapse, you reach a road junction. Here there are hundreds of bodies strewn across the ground twisted in tormented postures. Those in the process of dying are urinating, defecating, and vomiting. Somebody is pleading to God to grant them death. You feel that you too are dying. This is the end of the world. It cannot be anything else. You can open your eyes. We can't fully imagine what it was like to live through that atrocious night on December 2nd, 3rd, 1984. Its scale defies imagination and comprehension. 30 metric tons of lethal gases dispersed over five square miles of a densely populated city. Eight to 10,000 people, possibly more, there are no precise figures, dead within the first three days. 160,000 people admitted to hospitals in the first three weeks. Over half a million men, women, and children permanently damaged by a cocktail of gases so toxic that it scrambled their chromosomes, ravaged internal organs, and dissolved lung tissue. The awful news images from Bhopal haunted my adolescence, the first international event to unseat my perception of the way in which the world worked. It wasn't the first humanitarian catastrophe I'd seen images of, because on the very day that Bhopal happened, Band-Aid released the single, Do They Know It's Christmas, in response to the Great Ethiopian Famine, which was being shown in nightly news broadcasts at that time. But if the famine in Ethiopia was in large part a natural disaster, Bhopal was entirely man-made. And whereas in Ethiopia, the West was intervening as savior, apparently, in Bhopal, it was seemingly the cause. Over time, communities usually find ways to recover from natural disasters. A technological disaster endures. Bhopal has a beginning, but no end. It's happening still, and it's happening now, even as I speak these words to you. Take the story of Shanaz and Jamia. Shanaz thinks she was saved by her uncle that night. 
He'd recently left his job at the Union Carbide Pesticides Factory and was staying in her house only by chance. He'd already warned the members of the house that something was going to go badly wrong there one day. He knew that the best chance of survival was to stay put, close any openings, and cover their faces. Shanaza's future husband, Jamir, was not so lucky. He slept in an area swamped by gas that night. Due to the tragic death of his mother, Jamir had lived with his grandparents since the age of six. He survived the night, but he wasn't spared by it. The next morning, coughing, retching, swollen eyes weeping, howls of anguish all around him, 13-year-old Jamir knelt down to bathe his grandparents' lifeless bodies before their burial. Following the gas, there'd been reports of a spate of horrific births, numbers of miscarriages and stillbirths soared. Offers of marriage began to dry up for girls from gas-affected areas, but young men suffered less stigma. Overcoming the tragedies of his childhood, Jamir trained to be a mechanic. Finding a talent for Urdu, Shanaz studied hard and became a teacher. Together, they'd be able to build the best possible lives for themselves and their children. The hopes we hold rarely end abruptly. They fade, gradually overlain by others. Shanaz recalls taking Atik, her son, to see a doctor at the age of six months. Afterwards, nothing ever really seemed the same. Now, at 18 years of age, Atik can't take himself to the toilet, can't clean himself, can't feed himself. Shanaz, a teacher of language, hasn't been able to coax a single word from her son. Instead, for hours a day, as if in horror at his own helplessness, Atik tears at his clothes and screams. A few years after Atik was born, Shenaz was forced to leave teaching. If Jamir had remained healthy, they might have been able to cope without her salary. But as it was, steadily, stealthily, the effects of the gas overtook him. He suffers eye and breathing problems each day. Now, because Shanaz has to spend so much time caring for both Atik and Jamir, for food, for all else, Shanaz stitches elastic into underwear now. For nine dozen pairs, she can earn up to 60 pence a day. There are thousands of other families like that of Shanaz and Jamir all over Bhopal, desperately ill, penniless, without social support, without effective medical care, without psychological or emotional closure, locked in an endless cycle of re-victimization. Who should be taking responsibility for this ongoing humanitarian crisis? In my late twenties, I yearned for an adventure. I had the idea of riding a bicycle to India, uh, but I didn't want to go as a tourist, and Bhopal was my first thought as a destination. But then, I thought, you know, what can I do for Bhopal? It, it, surely its problems were settled years ago. As my world was pre-internet, I walked down to my local library and spent the day plowing through microfiche files of ancient news reports, forgotten news reports from 1984 onwards. And what I learned was profoundly shocking. Initial responses from Union Carbide, an $11 billion US multinational, seemed compassionate. Officials talked about finding the quickest and best way to get help to victims. Uh, they talked about taking moral responsibility for the disaster. But soon, billions of dollars of civil claims were filed in US courts, and Union Carbide faced possible bankruptcy. Now, lawyers argued that the plant had been managed entirely by Indians. They argued that India was the proper forum for the cases. They argued that they would have to call every single individual victim into court to take their testimony. An American judge agreed with their lawyers and said that America was the wrong forum for the cases. It was inconvenient. Once in India, the lawyers changed tactics. Now they contested the legitimacy of the courts they'd asked and pleaded to be tried before, and they threatened to appeal back to the US courts. And suddenly, without consulting a single victim, 
India settled with Union Carbide for just 15% of the original claims that were filed. So for the deaths of thousands of Indian citizens, for the maiming of over half a million more, Union Carbide's punishment amounted to a 49 cent per share hit on pre-tax dividends for the 1989 financial year. It was $2,000 per death and a pathetic $500 to each incurably ill victim. For many years after, there was little help for survivors and less hope. The sound of hacking coughs filled the slums around Carbide's abandoned factory from where new poisons were now seeping. People were struggling to make ends meet. Medical studies identified a host of problems, lung disorders, nervous disorder, system disorders, immune disorders. Uh, mental illness was at epidemic levels. Um, with thousands of people too ill to work, deep poverty was rife. Though much of Bhopal floundered in chronic despair, this wasn't the whole story. Sick, impoverished, with next to no education, Muslim and Hindu women of Bhopal put aside their veils and came together to fight for justice, health, and a life of dignity. They've held hundreds of demonstrations, taken direct actions, have led 500-mile rights marches and numerous hunger strikes. They've led surveys of Carbide's factory which proved that locals are being exposed to an avoidable and totally distinct environmental crime. They fought for and won clean piped water for those communities being affected by dangerously toxic chemicals and heavy metals in their drinking water. Their actions, and only their actions, forced Union Carbide's new owner, Dow Chemical, to cancel a $5 billion investment program in India. To achieve all this, they faced down police brutality, arrests, false charges, and even several company lawsuits, claiming thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages from them. I reached Bhopal by bicycle 18 years ago, unsure of what to expect. I found that a great catastrophe, followed by years of sickness, poverty, and injustice, can overwhelm and crush the human spirit, or it can enable ordinary people to discover they are extraordinary. Such people find they have the grit to survive, the defiance to face their persecutors, and the courage to fight back. Out of shared struggle, even, the, even in the midst of terrible sickness, comes strength, the joy of friendship, the realization that they are not weak, powerless, or contemptible, but possessed of great power, the power to bring about political change and to do great good in their communities and the world. Interventions by survivors revived criminal and civil proceedings in India's courts. Charged for the last 26 years, with negligent manslaughter of thousands of Indian citizens, the Indian Carbide simply refuses to show up for trial. As an American company, it says, it's not subject to India's legal jurisdiction. Its new owner, Dow Chemical, recently flouted five separate orders summoning it to appear in the very same trial. This isn't about justice in the abstract. Criminal prosecution of BP for the Deepwater Horizon disaster generated four and a half billion dollars in criminal fines and penalties for Gulf Coast residents. What could four billion dollars achieve in Bhopal? We can only know the consequences of its absence. Because the legal cases remain unresolved, survivors suffer prolonged acute suffering. Last year, Dow Chemical completed a $130 billion merger with DuPont to form the world's largest chemical company. In a year's time, they plan to split into three pieces. As a subsidiary of Dow, Union Carbide will also be split apart. Now, because criminal liability can't be transferred from one entity to another, this process might 
mean that Union Carbide never has to answer in a court of law for Bhopal. Earlier, I asked who should be taking responsibility for this humanitarian crisis. Well, it's perfectly clear that it won't be Dow Chemical and Union Carbide unless something extraordinary happens. There is not one international legal instrument through which they can be held to account. Free to choose their own response, they appear to suggest we should all live in a world in which multinational corporations are free to ravage the environment, to deny communities the right to have rights, to operate with impunity. A world in which the only ones to be punished are the victims themselves. Bhopal survivors refuse to accept that world. They say that no one anywhere ever should have to suffer another Bhopal. In their darkest times, the survivors appealed for friends and found they were not alone. They opened their own free first-class clinics and treated thousands whose lives had been hell. Treated abominably themselves, they practiced kindness and compassion and discovered the secret to the most powerful medicine of all. Their Sambhavna clinic has so far given free award-winning care to over 32,000 people, otherwise without help or hope. Damaged children, hundreds of damaged children, are given physiotherapy, speech therapy, children with nowhere else to turn by the Chingari Trust run by the survivors. The clinics are doing remarkable work, but they're only able to meet a fraction of the city's overall need. Cancers are running at 10 times national rates. Children suffer growth retardation, hormonal chaos, birth defects, with no clear sense of where Union Carbide ends and nature begins. No one knows how this story will end, but it surely won't be over until we enter and become a part of it. Our charities and efforts of ordinary people around the world to provide free care for survivors of gas and water poisoning. Every donation we receive is like gold to us, large or small, but it's not the only way to help. All of us can take action to challenge business as usual whenever businesses put shareholder dividends ahead of human rights and the environment. A world in which a Dow DuPont is unable to escape responsibility is a safer world for everyone. Together we can show the world what's left when hope, justice and even life appear out of reach. The answer and the secret to the most powerful medicine of all is love. Thank you. <laughs>